Um, but I want to spend more time talking about neuromodulation because this is going to be uh, an important option for, for more patients, I believe. Uh, so with neuromodulation, uh, we don't remove, ablate, or disconnect uh, any part of the brain. Uh, what we're doing here is putting in an imp a permanently implanted device similar to a pacemaker for the heart, uh, but here we're doing it for the brain, uh, that is going to stimulate the brain uh, over time uh, to help to treat the seizures. And so where, where does neuromodulation fit into the treatment of epilepsy? So uh, many patients will first try to add more drugs, even though we, we know that the, uh, that the seizures are, are drug resistant. Um, and that's because uh, drugs seem less invasive, uh, even though they ha do have quite a lot of side effects. Uh, for many people, it's still more appealing to add drugs. Uh, so, uh, the traditional surgery, the ablation or the resection, uh, this can be very good for, for seizure control, but it's still perceived by a lot of people as being very invasive. And for some people, if the seizures are coming from an area of the brain uh, that is not able to be safely removed, because we know that area of the brain is still supporting uh, important cognitive functions, or if the seizures are coming from multiple different areas of the brain uh, and it's not safe to remove multiple different areas of the brain, uh, that's really where, where neuromodulation fits in. So there's three uh, different devices uh, that we use for, for neuromodulation in epilepsy. They all deliver stimulation either directly or indirectly uh, to the brain. Uh, we're going to focus mostly today on responsive neurostimulation, but I'll also briefly mention uh, deep brain stimulation and vagus nerve stimulation. So responsive neurostimulation is the newest and most sophisticated of the neurostimulation, neuromodulation options. So here, what we're actually doing is doing both brain sensing and recording and stimulation. So there's a computer, uh, a small implantable computer uh, that's actually put into the skull. And that's the small device that you see here. Uh, it's actually uh, embedded in, in the skull uh, such that it is very low profile uh, and is not noticeable uh, after the surgery is completed uh, and the, the incision is closed up and the hair regrows uh, over that area. From there, there's a, from that device, there's two wires that actually go uh, into the areas of the brain that we believe from all the previous workup uh, to be most involved, the most involved areas of the brain. Uh, these can be put either on the brain's surface uh, or with a tiny wire uh, deep uh, in the brain. And what the device is doing is it's actually detecting uh, the seizures and then stimulating automatically uh, within milliseconds. So it, it detects uh, the abnormal activity, uh, stimulates responsibly, and then continues to monitor over time and repeats this cycle uh, as needed. Uh, this is the device shown up close, just so you can get a sense of what it looks like. It's thinner uh, than, than the average skull thickness, and so that's how it's able to be embedded in the skull, and it's actually curved uh, to the shape of the skull. And the whole system is really more than, than just the implanted uh, device. Uh, so the, your, your doctor will program uh, the device with their tablet. And then you at home will have a, a monitor uh, where you're able to actually collect the data that the device has been collecting over the previous days. And that gets sent up to the cloud. And then the physician can then review that data uh, as well. And this was uh, studied uh, over 10 years ago uh, in an FDA approved uh, study. And so what we're seeing here is the, the lines represent uh, the seizures per month uh, that patients are, are having. And so uh, in the trial, everyone got the device, uh, but for the first few months, uh, those uh, with the dotted gray line here, uh, the device was actually off and the patients didn't know that it was off. Uh, they were kept blinded to that. And, and those patients only had about a 17% reduction uh, in the frequency of their seizures with, medica with standard medication treatment. In the blue line, these are the patients who actually had the stimulation therapy, uh, and they had a 38% reduction in the frequency of their seizures. Uh, and this was just over the course of four months. And what's really interesting and exciting uh, about neuromodulation 
is that over time, uh, we seem to be seeing improvement. And so in the original study, patients were followed for nine years uh, after the trial, uh, and they found that the, the efficacy of the device, the percent reduction in seizure frequency, or the number of seizures that patients were having per month, uh, continued to decline over time from about 50% at year two uh, to on average 75% reduction in seizures out of year nine. Now, the important thing to keep in mind is that neuromodulation, at least as it exists right now, uh, is not going to be as effective as, as a resection or an ablation at making you completely seizure-free. So for seizure freedom, resection and ablation, uh, that's where we're talking about a 50, 60, sometimes 80% chance of, of seizure, of being completely seizure free. What we're talking about here is reducing the number of seizures, reducing the frequency of seizures. And that can still, it's not, you know, it doesn't allow you to do all the same activities that being seizure free would do, uh, but it can still be, uh, be a significant improvement in quality of life to have far fewer seizures. Uh, it can allow for improvements uh, in your cognitive function and, and mood. And we are seeing some signs that some patients, about almost 20% of patients, did go for a full one-year period uh, with, with seizure freedom. So it can give you very prolonged periods uh, without seizure freedom in some, in some patients. And the other piece of good news here that we're seeing in in newer studies, uh, in real world uh, studies, not the original trial, uh, we're seeing those kind of outcomes, uh, those percentage seizure reduction uh, in the first three years of treatment. So what it seems like is going on here is that we're actually uh, getting better at using the device uh, and we can uh, use algorithms and, and criteria to, to program uh, more effectively and more quickly get you that, that significant seizure reduction that we were originally getting in year seven, eight, and nine. We're now getting that in year one, two, and three. So what are the recovery and risks for, for this procedure for the RNS uh, device? Uh, so recovery here is typically one to two nights in the hospital uh, and then about two weeks at home. Uh, no, in, this is the data from the original uh, FDA study. Uh, there were no chronic stimulation uh, side effects. Uh, the risks were in generally similar to uh, deep brain stimulation, which has been done for decades for Parkinson's disease and tremor. So it was about a two to three percent chance of bleed, uh, but no long-term effects from any of those bleeds, and about a three three to four percent risk uh, of infection. And if, the, if an infection occurs, though, the device does need to be uh, removed. So this this is a bit of a complicated slide, just describing the differences between the responsive neurostimulation or RNS and deep brain stimulation, DBS, and vagus nerve stimulation. Uh, the important takeaways here is that the responsive neurostimulation is, is the device that's mainly doing the recording and actually stimulating in response to uh, those seizures. And we believe that that can be uh, a more effective way to treat uh, the seizures when it's, when it's an option. It's also giving uh, us and your neurologist uh, more data on what is going on with your seizures so we can monitor uh, the seizures over time because not everybody who has seizures is aware all the time uh, when they're having their seizures and the device is implanted in the skull. Deep brain stimulation works a little bit differently. Uh, the device is implanted, uh, the wires are implanted uh, deep in the brain, uh, but the uh, the battery uh, is implanted in the chest, more like a pacemaker, and the wires are all run up underneath the skin. Uh, this is, as I mentioned, uh, been a procedure that's been done for decades for Parkinson's disease and tremor, and it's very, very effective there. Um, the, this is a option uh, for patients that doesn't require you to upload your data. It's just something that's working all the time in the background. But on the downside, we don't learn uh, from, from the data that's being recorded because there's much less data that we can get from this device. Um, and then the vagus nerve stimulation. Uh, this is the least targeted approach. Here, we're trying to indirectly stimulate the brain uh, by stimulating uh, one of the largest nerves in the neck. Uh, and this uh, also, there's very limited ability to gain information uh, from the device. Uh, in terms of the, the battery life on each of these, the responsive neurostimulation has um, an eight year battery life and then it needs to re be replaced through a small incision in the scalp. Uh, but there's no brain surgery involved in the, in the repeat surgery. It's just a small incision in the scalp. 
the deep brain simulation lasts about five years, uh, but the battery, um, there, are, there is an option to actually have a rechargeable battery, if that's something that you're interested in. And then the vagus nerve stimulation battery lasts about 10 years before it needs to be replaced. All of the replacement surgeries to, uh, to put these devices in are, are much easier uh, and uh, less of an ordeal uh, than having the device put in the first time. Uh, patients typically come in in the morning uh, and go home the same day uh, after that, after about a half hour procedure.